she was the most seductive, sexual image of woman ever committed to celluloid. When Hollywood bored her, she walked out on Hollywood. Uh, when men bored her, she walked out on them. She was, she's the only unrepentant hedonist, the only pure pleasure seeker I think I've ever known. And this comes over in her films. The film actress Louise Brooks, who died last summer, was celebrated as one of Hollywood's most beautiful women. But her reputation rests almost entirely on her work during a brief visit to Europe in the late 20s, and particularly for her legendary performance as the reckless pleasure seeker Lulu in G.W. Pabst's Pandora's Box. Her subsequent Hollywood career was a sad and ignominious decline. For years, she seemed to have disappeared without trace, until she was rediscovered by film enthusiasts towards the end of her life. It was then that she found a new career as a penetrating commentator on the foibles of Hollywood. Power was the most important thing. The producers fought for power. Money was a means for power. And to sleep with beautiful women. It was that marvelous thing of walking around and ruling. I loved the line of, of Max Sennett when he wanted to have his own company, and he tried to talk these gamblers into backing him, horse gamblers. And the thing that finally succeeded was that he introduced them at parties to all these lovely girls. And uh, Senate said, he said, that's how they happened to invest their money. He said they decided it would be perfectly fine to own beautiful girls, actresses. And that's own. what it amounts, own. And own. that's what it amounts to. In 1982, Brooks wrote a collection of professional and personal memoirs, Lulu in Hollywood. It surprised and delighted readers, not only with its frankness, but also the assurance of its style. Our house back in Wichita, a 14-room grey frame structure, was literally falling down with books. The foundations on the right-hand side had sunk 11 inches from the weight of books in father's third-floor retreat. When my older brother and I got into a fight, my father would retire to his law books and violin on the third floor, and my mother, whose sense of the absurd almost always reduced crime and punishment to laughter, often simply laughed. One day, I ran to her to confess that I had just smashed a cup from her best set of Haviland china. Without looking at me, she said, Now, dear, don't bother me while I'm memorizing Bach. She did, however, foster my dancing career. It began when I was 10. With her talent for dancing, Brooks was much in demand at local functions in southern Kansas, but she was soon on her way to New York. She enrolled at the Dennis Shawn Academy, then in the forefront of modern American dance. She starred with the principal of the Academy, Ted Shawn, in the ballet Feather of the Dawn, but the lure of the other strand of American dance was to prove irresistible. By some shift which has never been quite made clear, she was soon appearing in the George White Scandals, and then as a specialty dancer in the Ziegfeld Follies. It was New York, August 1925. Chaplin, aged 36, was in town for the premiere of The Gold Rush at the Strand Theatre on Broadway. I, aged 18, was dancing in the Ziegfeld Follies, round the corner at the New Amsterdam Theatre on 42nd Street. Submerged in my own fascinating being, I was only vaguely aware that the gold rush had brought Chaplin his greatest triumph, that he was the toast of all intellectual, cultural, and social New York. We had an affair for two happy summer months. Most of our time together was spent in a big, airy apartment atop the Ambassador. I danced, and Charlie returned to reality, the world of his creative imagination. He recalled his youth with comic pantomimes, he acted out countless scenes for countless films, and he did imitations of everybody. Isadora Duncan danced in a storm of toilet paper. John Barrymore picked his nose and brooded over Hamlet's soliloquy. A Follies girl swished across the room, and I began to cry, while Charlie denied absolutely that he was imitating me. Taken at this time for Vanity Fair magazine was the Edward Steichen photograph. He is grinning with infectious naughtiness into the camera, and at the same time, Steichen has caught his horned curls in a fawn shadow on the background. Brooks was often to be seen with the men of New York's Café Society. The inevitable screen offer came about through a meeting with the English-born director, Edmund Goulding. 
Did you ever see Eddie Goulding? He was the most extraordinary looking man with these brilliant blue eyes and his intensity, no matter what it is. And of course, the English accent. Now, I'm a girl in Scandals, and all the girls in the Follies and Scandals born don't ever have anything to do with a man who offers you a screen test. Oh, never. He is a bad man. So I was sitting down for lunch with Eddie Goulding and the Algonquin and one of the banquets. I don't know whether it's a dining room or it's the same place. And he said, how would you like a movie test? Oh, I said, no. I said, I really wasn't scared because I'd been around a good deal. I was 17 then. I said, no, I, I, I'm not interested in movies. I want to be a great dancer like Martha Grant. Well, he said, that doesn't make any difference. He said, to hell with the movie test. How would you like to go out with me this afternoon? I had the most amazing afternoon I've ever had. Goulding was later to be ostracized for his raucous lifestyle, but at the time, he introduced Brooks to some of the most influential men in the entertainment business. I was invited to a party that night with some of the girls from the Scandals, and the men, among the men were Walter Wanger and Joe Skank and Lord Beaverbrook. Lord Beaver. So we all the girls went up into this little gray suite in the Ritz and we were introduced and we had drinks and we talked uh, and uh, I saw that Lord Beaverbrook was very very interested in the girl I liked most in the scandal. She was a darling girl from the South, a darling girl. And they were talking and very cozy and I watched discreetly, and they did disappear into the little gray bedroom and the little gray suite in the Ritz, and then they came out a while later. And a few days later, she told me that she had a contract at MGM. And she did go to MGM, and she did do very well. And I say, hooray for Lord Beaverbrook. <laughs> Through the influence of Walter Wanger, one of the heads of Paramount, Brooks herself moved into pictures. One of her earliest surviving films is Love em and Leave em from 1926, in which she plays a sly shop assistant, using her natural charms to make her way in the world. Brooks made an instant impact with the fan magazines of the period. Describing Louise presents its difficulties. She is so very Manhattan, very young, exquisitely hard-boiled. Her black eyes and sleek black hair are as brilliant as Chinese lacquer. Her skin is white as a camellia. Her legs are lyric. She is just 19. For my third picture, she explained, shifting herself languidly, I'm supposed to play opposite W.C. Fields in the old army game. I've played with Bill before in the Follies. Now they want me to play opposite him over there, but I'm not going to. But they've announced you in the cast, I protested weakly. Yes, said Louise, I know they have. They think I'm going to play it, but I'm not. I don't want to play a part where I race around a funny man all the time, and I won't. It was through a friend in the Follies that I came to know Bill Fields. At the florist on Park Avenue before the matinee, we would select a bouquet to be wrapped in waxed paper and present to Bill in his dressing room. It touched his heart. Bill adored beautiful girls, but few were invited to his dressing room. He was morbidly sensitive about the eczema that inflamed his nose and sometimes erupted on his hands so that he had had to learn to juggle wearing gloves. After several devastating experiences with beautiful girls, he had decided to restrict himself to girlfriends who were less attractive and whom he would not find adrift with saxophone players. He was an isolated person. Years of traveling alone around the world with his juggling act taught him the value of solitude and the release it gave his mind. Most of his life will remain unknown. 
Racing around a funny man did have its compensations, however. Directing the film was a young man dubbed by Anita Luce the Beau Brummel of the era, Edward Sutherland. Brooks married him in 1927. By now, Paramount thought her a potential star, but it was with some reluctance that she moved to Hollywood. Eddie Sutherland gave, my husband gave absolutely the best parties in Hollywood. He gave, he invited the most amusing people, Wilson Meisner, of course, who would always insult someone uh, at a dinner party. He would rise in a stately fashion. He didn't drink. He smoked opium once in a while, but of course not at a party. But he had the most amusing people in Hollywood, uh, Eddie did. He always had uh, the best writers. And then he would have Irving Thalberg and Norma Shearer. And, and, and uh, I was supposed to be very sophisticated in Hollywood. That was purely on the strength of my having the most magnificent uh, Paris, New York wardrobe. And of course, being very sniffy. I was, don't forget, I was a great intellectual. I'd read Tolstoy. And, uh, I really was just a hick from Kansas. And as Anita Luce said, when she threw me out of Gentlemen Prefer Blonde, she said, Louise, if I ever write a part for a cigar store Indian, you will get it. I didn't even talk then. Perhaps as a response to these homespun qualities, William Wellman cast Brooks in one of her best silent films, Beggars of Life. After murdering her cruel guardian, Brooks disguises herself as a boy and goes on the run with hobo Richard Arlen. finished with our particular scenes early one night, Dick Arlen surprised me by asking me to have a drink. I was surprised partly because Dick was the undefiled type who did not touch booze, and also because his winning smile concealed a strong dislike for me. His jaw muscles twitched as he hunched close to me to deliver his monologue. It sure is too bad about your getting a divorce from a swell guy like Eddie Sutherland and a swell director, he said. When you're not his wife anymore, everybody expects Paramount to fire you. They don't know you're a pet of the front office. Funny thing, I've been working at Paramount for three years. A damn fine actor, too, and I make a stinking $400 a week while you ride around in your damn Lincoln Town Car with its damn black satin finish. You, why, you can't even act. You're not even good looking. You're a lousy actress and your eyes are too close together. Having concluded his curse upon me, Dick stood up, snatched away his bottle of whiskey, and swaggered from...